For the last two years, we've been making all sorts of projects here on CNC Base Camp. I have learned so much and it's been a lot of fun. On this episode, we're gonna look back a little bit at some of those projects and some of the things we've covered. Next month, whole new project. So I hope you join me then. Well, over the last year, I've had a couple people write in wondering about the electronics in our shop-made CNC machine. In a commercial machine, everything's packaged up into a little silver box. So you're really not sure what's in there. But when you make one, you have to learn a little bit. But it's not hard. So let me walk you through all the different parts that make the CNC machine go. Let's go ahead and start with the power source. This is an 8.8 .8 amp transformer. It puts out 36 volts. That's what's going to make our motors go. From there, we have three motors and three drivers. The drivers help control the action of the motors. Each driver has a series of different choices that we have to make on it. These choices are controlled by what are called dip switches, dual inline package switches, what they're called. And this is a, what they call a keyboard variety because it kind of looks like piano keys. They're just simple on off switches, nothing more. When you look at the driver, you'll see two sets of information here. On this one, the top set is setting the number of micro steps. Now, what's a micro step? Well, each motor is divided into 200 individual steps, so it's not rotating like a conventional fan motor. It's cogging its way through 200 individual cogs. Those individual steps can then be broken down electronically. The 200 steps are set up electromechanically within the motor. The micro steps are set up electronically within the driver. There are a number of choices on this one. One, half, quarter, eighth, sixteenth, thirty-second, and one sixty-fourth. And that is how many times we're going to divide each of those 200 steps within a full rotation. The lower chart has to do with the amperage that our motor is going to draw. So we set up the switches to accommodate the micro-stepping and we set up the switches to accommodate the amperage draw. So hypothetically, if I wanted to set up a one-half step, and that's going to divide those 200 steps into 400 then, I would set the switches at on, off, off. And it's just a matter of flipping the switches up or down into the on or off position. Nothing more than that. In order to set the amperage, let's say I were to choose 2.4 amps, I can see that my switches number 5, 6, and 7 are set at off, on, off. So it's actually pretty simple to make the right choice and to set up your driver for the motor configuration that you want. So moving on to the individual motor, the motors are, of course, different sizes, and they're sold by in ounces for the torque that they'll put out. I have three motors here that I bought as a package from Build Your CNC. This was a package meant for a homemade machine with a fairly heavy gantry. Well, this machine does have a kind of a heavy gantry because I want it to be very solid and very rigid. So this large motor powers my gantry back and forth along what I've selected to be the x-axis. The two smaller motors are powering the z-axis and also the y-axis. These smaller motors have eight wires. The larger one has four, but they're essentially the same. We're using what's called a bipolar setup, and thank goodness there are instructions with the motors, wiring diagrams, and the Builder CNC site that I use has a lot of great information, and that really helped me out to know what, how to color code everything and how to wire it. Now for all these motors, the wires ended up being paired. So there were essentially four connections made to the motor. These motors have two coils in them. So typically you're going to find the nomenclature to be A plus, A minus, and B plus, B minus for your connections. A plus and A minus go to one coil. B plus and B minus go to the other coil. So it's really not that hard. The cables which are going to connect the motors 
to the drivers for this machine are what are called high duty cycle cables. Now for a lot of commercial machines you're going to see a wire management rack holding the cables in place. Those have to suffer a high duty cycle as well but for my machine to keep things simple I simply have the cables looped very loosely on the exterior of the machine. But the cables are meant to be able to go through cycles millions of times so they're just the right cable for what we're doing here. One thing that is important is that you choose a cable that's shielded. Electromagnetic interference can always be a problem with a CNC machine. Electromagnetic interference can happen from dust collectors, any kind of motor, any kind of electronic devices you have functioning around them. And so shielding is important. In order to control the motors, we need to have what's sometimes called a breakout board or a controller, and that's what this is. The controller or breakout board has microelectronics in it which tie everything together and help interpret the G-code being sent to it. All of these connecting points will connect to those cables, which connect to our drivers, which connect to the motors. The breakout board is specific to a software that you're going to use to operate your machine. This breakout board is specific to a program called Mach 3, which I have up on the screen right now. Mach 3 is what I will download all of my files into. It's how I will operate the machine when I need to change a bit, stop it, or do any of those sorts of commands. There are other operating systems other than Mach 3. There's Planet CNC and there's a host of others. That's a choice you have to make when you build your own machine. They're all pretty good. I've used both Mach 3 and Planet CNC and they're fantastic, each of them. And so that's really the basics of how our homemade CNC machine operates. It's got the same components you have in any commercial machine, it's just that they're all not neat and tidy in a little silver box. But learning about the electronics, learning how to wire them is part of the fun and it's part of what makes this such an exciting opportunity when you build your own CNC machine. Well, I've just finished completing a number of inlaid box lids for episode 6 of Basecamp. And with these inlays, I was using a 1 16th and sometimes a 1 32nd inch router bit. Small bits and a project that required great accuracy. So I thought it'd be a good time to talk a little bit about maintenance on the Woodsmith machine. Some of the items we're going to go over are specific to this machine. Some are going to be applicable to other kit machines or plug and play type machines. So let's go over a number of things here that will help ensure accuracy and good performance with your router. First thing, let's begin with a little bit of collet care. So the collet that I have here is a precision collet, which I really recommend as an aftermarket accessory for these one horsepower routers. You can see we have a collet nut, a one quarter inch collet, and a one eighth inch collet. So very important to keep them very clean. Now what came with this collet was a bit of collet care cleaner. And one thing I really want to stress when dealing with, with collets, and I'm sure you've probably read articles in the different woodworking magazines, is being very careful not to score them anyway and being gentle with them. And so we don't want to use any kind of a wire brush. I'm putting the gloves on here because this collet cleaner actually is a, it's got petroleum distillates but also has boron in it and so they recommend that you don't get it on your, on your fingers. It's a little hard to get into this 1 8 inch collet but I can at least clean the exterior of it and really make sure it's nice and clean. The 1 quarter inch of course is a little easier to get down in there inside the collet itself and I want to go around the exterior and make sure everything is nice and clean. If there's any dust trapped within the slots that divide the collet, I need to get that out. And we want to keep it nice and clean. Equally important is that we get up into the router itself because the dirt really does tend to cake inside the shaft area. You can see my Q-tip here is coming out pretty black. And then we also want to make sure the threads are very clean too. If you feel you need to use a brush, 
Please use something with nylon bristles or brass bristles, but not steel. As soon as we start putting score marks into metal, then that becomes a place where more and more dirt gets trapped. So as you can see from the Q-tip, it was worth cleaning that. The next step in taking care of our Woodsmith CNC router is going to be to clean the aluminum rails. Because they're exposed, we do get a little bit of a buildup of dirt on them over time. Cleaning them is nothing more than taking a soft rag or paper towel and wiping them down. And as you can see, I'm picking up a little bit of dirt off of them. I want to go ahead and wipe down both rails of the y-axis, both rails of the x-axis, and the z-axis as well. Now as you're doing this, you can kind of do half at a time, and then you'll need to move the gantry about to access the balance of the rail. So the paper towel gets most of the grit off. To finish things up, I find it useful to use a little bit of solvent. You don't want to use much, but it does help get things nice and clean. One thing I want to stress here with these aluminum rails is please don't use anything abrasive like a scotch bright on them. As with the collet, when we scratch the surface of the metal, all it does is provide a perfect place for more dirt and debris to lodge. So keep things smooth, keep them polished, and don't use anything abrasive on them. So I'll move the gantry back, clean the other side with the solvent, and then go through all the different rails and make sure they're clean. When that's done, then we move on to the V-bearings. Well, now that our rails are clean, it's time to move on to the V-bearings. Pretty simple. What we want to do is use a, a small brush like this, or an old toothbrush would be great too, and just gently knock all of the debris out of the bearing. Once you get as much as you can, you'll need to move your gantry and have the bearings rotate slightly so that you're cleaning all the way around them. Well, next up in our CNC maintenance program is going to be to make sure that the V-bearings are tightly engaged with the rails. And what we're doing there is we're essentially preloading each of the carriages on each of the axes. So we preload the bearings on the x-axis, on the y-axis, and on the z. And by putting everything under tension, under pressure actually in this case, we're going to make sure that we don't have backlash and any rattling. It's all going to be solid, firm, smooth action, and that's going to give you accuracy. With this machine, each carriage has two fixed bearings and two bearings in opposition to those which are adjustable. So this is an example of this bearing and this bearing. You can see I've got a handle to rotate here on the front. I've got a one inch dowel and the hole for this bolt that goes all the way through is offset. So, I don't know if you can see it, I'm going to rotate this slightly, you can see that the bearing and washer package on the end is offset, and so it has a cam action. When I loosen the bolt that goes through this cam, I can then rotate it and set a tension or a pressure upon the rail. I'll do that by just taking a pair of wrenches, loosening the nut, and then I can actually rotate and put a nice solid tension on the bearing. Now we don't want it too tight. Having it too tight will cause excessive and premature wear, but we want it nice and snug so that our carriage has no movement to it whatsoever. And this is an important thing to check before any project which demands absolute precision. The simplest way to do it is just take your fingers and feel if you can rotate any of these bearings. You shouldn't really be able to. They should be firmly applied to the rail and they should be difficult to move with just your fingers. 
So if you check that, that'll keep things accurate and you'll be happy with the performance of your machine. Another mechanical element that we need to care for on our CNC router are the lead screws. So there's a lead screw for the Z axis. There's a lead screw for the Y axis. And then running underneath the machine is a lead screw for the X axis. Now, as with our other components, we want to take a little time to make sure that they're clean with a soft brush. You'll probably need to move things several times to get them to rotate. Once you've got all the dust off of the lead screws and they're clean, we want to apply a dry lubricant to them. It's important that we don't use oils because they'll attract more dirt. There are a lot of different kinds of dry lubricants. This one happens to be Teflon based. So what I'm going to do is just put a small spray along the whole length of my lead screw. And I'll do that for all three of them. Now I know that the our X lead screw is a little harder to get to, so you will need to prop the router up just a little bit, but you don't have to do that, that that often, so not a big deal. With the lead screws lubricated, another thing that we want to check, and this is a long-term maintenance item, is the anti-backlash nuts. The anti-backlash nuts engage the lead screws and are the way that the action of the lead screw is then transmitted to the different carriages. What I have in my hand here is a Delrin anti-backlash nut off a machine very similar to this. So there are three anti-backlash nuts in this unit. One for the Z, one for the Y, and then underneath on the gantry, one for the X-axis. What we're checking for on these is any excessive wear. So if you look down and you see things uh, that give you some clues, maybe the surfaces look worn, maybe the surfaces look a little rough, it may be time to change these out. I changed the anti-backlash nuts on another unit like this after about 400 hours of operation. The one for the x-axis sees a little more rugged use because of the weight of the gantry than the one on the z-axis, so that's really the one to start with. You know, anti-backlash nuts are very unique items. What it is, is a nut that has essentially been split into three sections. So think of your collet on your router and then there's a cage that surrounds it and a metal spring which forces that cage around the collet and keeps it tight and what that does is it keeps the nut always tight around the lead screw and it doesn't allow it to rattle and because it's tight it can't move it compensates for wear that gives us accuracy and it removes the contingency of, of backlash, which is the enemy of all machines, especially routers. So once you've checked your anti-backlash nuts, cleaned and lubricated the lead screws, that completes the maintenance for your Woodsmith CNC router. All right, well, we've completed the primary tasks in taking care of your CNC router. One last thing, do make sure that you go around and check all of the fasteners on this machine. Now, this machine is home built. It's made primarily of Baltic birch plywood, and so it's stable, but it's still wood. And it's going to be subject to some seasonal movement. So it's important that with every swing of the seasons, you do take some time just to tighten everything up. Now, this whole process may seem like a lot of different individual items, but really, it only takes about half an hour at most to do everything. So it's pretty easy. How often should you go through all this? Well. I think dealing with the collet care, cleaning the rails, cleaning the bearings, that's maybe a four time a year activity, depending on how often you use your machine. Dealing with the lead screws, checking your anti-backlash nuts, that's a yearly activity. Tightening up all the fasteners, as I said, seasonal, let's say twice a year. So it doesn't really take very much care to keep your Woodsmith CNC router in peak condition. You know, most of us use a one horsepower or a horse and a half router with our CNC machines. And those routers were going to see a lot of use, hour after hour after hour, carving signs, making furniture, doing all sorts of things. So with that kind of a life, problems are eventually going to happen. Now, some router problems are lethal to the machine. For instance, if the commutator shorts out or if you have a bearing failure, some router problems are pretty easy fixes. 
maybe the cord fatigues the stress relief or you have to replace a switch. One thing that's definitely going to happen if you run your router long enough is that the brushes are going to wear out. Now when that happens, the springs that apply pressure against the brushes to help it push against the commutator, well, they just won't be able to apply that pressure and arcing is going to occur between the brush and the commutator. Now that arcing can result in some erratic router operation and it can throw a lot of electromagnetic interference which may affect your CNC machine. So if your CNC machine starts acting strangely, don't blame it all on the machine until you think about your router and check to make sure your brushes are in good shape. Changing out the brushes is an easy operation and I'd recommend you go ahead and purchase a set before you need them. That way they're there. I have two of these routers and both of them are on their second set of brushes. Now I expect I can probably get a third set in them. Past that, I think the machine is probably going to be worn out and it'll be time for a new router. Along with having an extra set of brushes, good collet care matters. I have a precision collet on this machine, but regardless, we always want to take a little air and blow all the dust out and some solvent and really get up inside the cone, inside the spindle, and make sure that that is nice and clean. One thing that I got when I purchased this precision collet was this product, which is a collet care cleaner. And it has PTFE, which is a type of plastic, and boron nitride, which is a synthetic ceramic, which acts like graphite. These compounds are going to keep my collet operating smoothly. And if it's clean and operating smoothly, it's going to last longer and it's really going to grip that bit and give me better operation. So, two things you can do. Plan on replacing the brushes, plan on a program of good collet care, and you can more than double the life of your router. Well, as you know, building things in your shop, things can sometimes go wrong that you don't expect. So I wanted to show you something that happened to me while making our project today. This is one of the side panels in progress. Now we have the back, and that was roughed out and also did the finish cut, everything's fine. The roughing pass went fine for the front. The machine was busy with the finish pass on the front and all of a sudden the bit went out of control, went back through the back of the, my blank, around and towards the front again. And it just barely missed some bits of metal and I was lucky I stopped the machine before it bro broke the bit. I thought, well, okay, that's weird, fine. I've got a lot of time invested in this part. I'll just go ahead and run the profile cut and I'll just finish what I need to by hand after going through the, all the other operations. Won't be too bad. Well, I put a straight bit in and we started running the profile pass. And what happens? All of a sudden, for no apparent reason, the router goes off to the interior and, and just destroys the part. Well, what's going on? Well. Near as I can figure, what's happening is a, we're having an episode of electromagnetic interference, and that does happen sometimes. Now, I think I mentioned in a previous episode that I've had that occur when using my home-built Woodsmith machine. Uh, about two winters ago, I was using it, and I had a dust collector hooked up to it. It had very dry winter air, and it just kept misbehaving. It would just stop, the machine would wander aimlessly, I didn't really have anything destroyed, but it was just so frustrating. Well, when I turned the dust collector off, everything returned to normal, and I finished out the day without any problem whatsoever. And this really seems similar. Now, what could have set it off? Well, with all this work to do, I was trying to use two machines at once. So I had my next wave machine working on this panel. I had the Woodsmith machine over here. I had the air cleaner on, and I had a vacuum cleaner on. There was just all sorts of things happening. So I'm going to guess it was a case of electromagnetic interference causing the machine to lose its track and get a little bit confused. So I know I need to either separate them with a greater distance or run one machine at a time or it could never happen again. Who knows? But it's an interesting phenomenon. It's probably going to happen to you at some point. It's one of those things of operating a CNC machine in the home. You know, almost every CNC comes with an extruded aluminum table like this. And it's super handy. They're great for 
hold downs, which are a fantastic way to keep your work solidly in place. The only problem is when it's time to do through cutting, well, then you need a spoil board. I have a simple system here for spoil boards, which really works great. What I have is a plywood base, and I have a number of screws and T-nuts so that I can easily slide my spoil board on and off. Glued to it, I have three layers of MDF, and I've sized them just under the entire cutting format area for my router. So if I stick within this area, I know that I'm not going to exceed that format routing area and hit the extent of my router. As I surface my spoil board, I'm of course creating an accurate surface for doing exacting work because these aluminum tables are never quite true to the gantry and to the motion of the router. When we use a spoil board, we know we get accuracy every time we surface it. Now, as we surface our spoil board due to use, because we need to true things up, we are going to, of course, start to lose some of that MDF. But hey, no problem. Surface it one last time and then glue another layer on, resurface that, you're good to go. Now you'll notice I've got quite a few layers here. Yes, that does cut some of the z-axis height down, but generally I use my machine a lot for doing work which I would consider pretty, pretty exact, pretty high tolerance. That's what I enjoy doing. By creating a thicker surface here, I'm elevating the work closer to the rails on the gantry, and I feel like that cuts down some of the lateral forces exerted on my router and makes things a little more accurate, a little truer. And it also just gives me a lot of bulk here that absorbs vibration, and it's a lot of bulk that will hold screws very well. My favorite screw, pocket hole screws, coarse thread. That washer head is just fantastic. I love the square drive. So give yourself some good options. You've got the extruded aluminum table on your CNC machine. Make a spoil board that's just for woodworking and keep it clean and nice. And then make another one for kind of dirty, oily work like cutting aluminum. That way you're always going to have the right system for whatever kind of work you're doing because a CNC can do some pretty amazing things. Well, we all want our CNC routers to be as accurate as possible. So one thing you do need to check is to see if the spindle or router is perpendicular with the work surface. Now, if you're using a spoil board, it's pretty easy to tell if it's out. If you look right here, you'll see all these lines from the last time I surfaced the spoil board. It feels like clapboard siding. Well, what that is, is that my bit is at an angle, and that's why it's creating all those steps. And it's at an angle because my spindle is cocked a little bit. Well, that's a problem, isn't it? Now, it's easy to tell when using a spoil board when that's happening, because you do get these lines. When they're on the right and the left of the spindle, it just means that the spindle is cocked a little bit like so. When you find them on the front and the back, that means the spindle or router is leaning either out or back. It's a little harder to tell if you're using a machine with the aluminum bed, but you can tell and you can correct the problem. And we're going to correct the problem by using this very simple jig. It's a tramming jig. It's just a piece of one by two, about 12 inches long. I've got a machine screw on one end with the head and on this end, I'm using the same machine screw, but I've cut the head off. So what we're going to do is chuck it into the machine. Once it's in place, I'm going to carefully lower my spindle until this bolt is just a little bit off the surface. All right, my trammel's in place. And I have it so it just drags on this side. Now I'm going to rotate it and see what happens. Well, it's rising up here. Oh boy, it's rising quite a bit over here. There's a large gap between it and the spoil board. And now towards the back, a little less, but there's still a gap. So what's that telling me? Well, it's telling me that my spindle is leaning quite a bit towards me and it's leaning back a little bit. 
So how do we deal with that? Well, the manufacturer's recommendation for this unit is to ream these holes out a little bit, allowing it a bit of wiggle room, and that will take care of the right to left lean. And then I'll use paper shims behind the mounting block to lean it forward. So every machine is going to be a little bit different, but there should be a simple procedure you can do to make sure that your rattle or spindle is perpendicular to your work surface the whole way around. And the trammel is how you're going to find out, and the trammel is how you're going to solve the problem. So we all want the best out of our CNC machines, and this is an important thing you need to check, and an important thing to take care of. And one thing I wanted to talk to you about today is noise-induced hearing loss. Now, as we age, we all lose a little bit of hearing. In fact, everyone in here can hear a high-frequency pitch out coming out of the CNC machine. I can't. But one thing we can really avoid is the damage to our hearing that power machinery and power tools do. You know, it's, it's not just your shop tools, it's the lawnmower, it's the chainsaw, it's machinery, it's all those different things and it all adds up over time. So we really have to be careful with our hearing throughout our lives. So I wanted to point out a couple of different options for hearing protection that we use here at the Woodsmith shop. This is one that I kind of like and these are a molded rubber plug and they're nice because I can put them in and take them out very quickly and easily. They're on a cord so they don't get lost. When I'm at home mowing the lawn, this is kind of my hearing protection of choice because it's so simple. And as I said, I can just take them out and in and out very quickly and easily. Super simple to use. This style of hearing plug has a decibel reduction of about 27. That's pretty good. Another style of hearing protection are these little foam plugs. Once again, they come on a cord. These you have to roll up a little bit, insert them in your ear, and then they expand out. They work very well. A lot of people find these to be reasonably comfortable over a couple of hours. Any ear plug is going to hurt a little bit over time, but these do a pretty good job. And I find if you get good quality plugs like these out of the molded rubber, they're not too bad. With the foam style earplugs, you get two or three uses and then it's time to replace them. These you can wash and get a couple of usings out of. Now when I'm in the shop, I really prefer muffs. I just think that they're much, much more comfortable. They've got this soft padding on them. They're easy to take on and off. And these particular ones have a rating of 31 decibels of reduction. And that's pretty good. You'll find most of the hearing uh, protection equipment runs about 23 to 31 decibels. Go for the high end. Get something a minimum of 27 decibels, preferably about 30. Now for me, we keep big boxes of these other style earplugs all around in the shop, and I've got a box at home. I find I need about four pairs of these. It's kind of like six inch rulers, pencils and measuring tapes. If I keep four around, I lose three, but I can generally find one because they don't do any good if you don't use them. So protect your hearing, get plenty of options, keep them around your garage and your shop, and over the long term, you'll be glad you did. Part of owning a CNC machine is buying router bits, probably a few more router bits than we'd like to be paying for. One of the choices in buying a router bit is do I get plain carbide or do I get a coated bit? You know, the coatings cost a little more money, and I'm already paying a lot of money for the bit. So here's what I'm doing. Whenever I have a bit that I know is going to see hardware and hard service, I think it's a good idea to go ahead and get the coating. As an example, the two bits here are both metal cutting bits for brass and aluminum. I know they're going to see some work, and so I think the coating's worthwhile for those. Next up, these two are both plastic cutting bits, and that's the Amana Spectra line. You know, plastic can be kind of gummy. It can be difficult, and heat's a problem. So once again, I think probably the coating is a good idea. This bit is for carving work, and there's an awful lot of wear at the very tip. That's a tapered 1 32nd inch ball nose. So I want that bit to last as long as I can because it's really going to be going back and forth over the carvings. Next to it is just a plain carbide straight bit. And so that's one of my regular service bits. 
and I think it's probably fine as is. Now the best thing that we can do to preserve our router beds is by making sure we are using the right feed rate and the right depth of cut. So of course the general rule is the depth of cut is approximately half the diameter of the bit with the exception of harder materials like the metals and then you really want to ease up on the depth of cut. Probably the most important thing then is our feed rate. We want to go fast enough that we're really producing chips and not allowing heat build up. The coatings have a couple of advantages. One is they're much sharper and they maintain the sharpness of the bit. Two, heat. They really do a better job of dissipating heat than an uncoated bit. And heat kills router bits. We really want to watch that. Also, the coatings provide lubricity for the bit. In other words, it's a fine structure, a fine grain structure. So materials are less likely to build up on the bit. We've all seen our table saws get kind of gummy and nasty. Well, the coatings will help prevent that on your router bits. And finally, the coatings make the bit much harder at the edge, as much as two or two and a half times. So all that adds up to a sharper bit and a longer lasting bit. So, is it worth it? I think so, but I think it's only worth it on your really hard service bits. Otherwise, go for plain carbide. When you're setting up your roughing and finishing cuts to do any type of carving work, you're given a choice between raster and offset cutting methods. The raster method typically starts at one end and just goes back and forth and progresses across your carving. You do have the option to set the raster at an angle. Now very often what I like to do for roughing cuts is use the raster method at 45 degrees. It's a very efficient way of clearing all the waste. I don't often use the raster for a finishing cut because it can leave a slight fluting, slight marks that are visible to the eye across your carving. What I prefer for the finishing cut is to use the offset method, which just tracks back and forth. Over the majority of the carving, the bit will then be following the grain, and I just think it's less visible and produces a little bit better quality of a cut. But it depends on the material, it depends on the wood, and it's something for you to experiment with. So raster versus offset, it's one of the choices you have to make when you're setting up for carving work. Well recently I've been having fun using a small benchtop CNC machine. You know they come in at a great price point, they don't take up much room, and super fun. But there's a couple things about it that were kind of bothering me and I wanted to see if I could improve it just a little bit. And we do that with a lot of tools around here. You know, think about upgrades to your drill press table or an outfeed table on the table saw. Sometimes doing a few things makes all the difference to bringing the tool up to performance. Well, I wanted to add a couple things. The first off, some storage. The router bits that I use for my CNC router are not the router bits I use in the balance of the shop. So I want those separate. And I also want a place for a wrench and all the different things that I might need. So I went ahead and made a base for my router and put in a nice deep drawer, full extension slides. Now, I like to use these little acro mill boxes and label all the bits because I've got a bunch of them, keep them all separate. If you want to put wood blocks and have them standing up, that's just fine. Also, I've got all my hold downs, a wrench, you know, guidebooks, anything you need. And it's just great to have it all in one spot. Another thing I wanted to do was I wanted to work a little bit with being able to hold down the workpiece. See, here's the deal. The aluminum table you know, of this router comes to about this point, and I can't hold anything down using hold downs or blocks or otherwise and still use the full format size of the router. So I've looked at two different solutions to that. Now, solution one is to use a spoil board. I've got this one loose right now, but I'm going to mount it down just using some simple screws. And these are spot welding nuts, and they fit the aluminum track just fine. You can buy those by the bucket full from uh, any of the industrial suppliers like McMaster Car or Granger. And they're also available from, I think, the, as accessories from the CNC companies too. 
So the spoil board is much larger than the aluminum table. It hangs off the sides and it hangs off the front. And that really gives me a lot of options how I can screw down blocks of wood to hold work pieces in place. You know, one of the advantages is with a spoil board is that we'll surface it down and we can make it perfectly smooth and that increases your overall accuracy. And as things get cut up, you know, you simply resurface it and it's bright and new again. Well, what I like to do is to make a separate elevated board that represents the format size of my machine. That way I don't have to wonder if I put a part here, can the machine reach it? As long as I have it on this platform, I know that the machine can mill it. And when this gets chewed up and resurfaced and goes about all the way down to the surface of my primary board here, well, I just take another piece and I glue it on and I start over again. It's super easy and there are no fasteners to hit. Now, if I want to use the aluminum table, I can always loosen up the screws that hold those spot welding nuts on and simply slip the table out the back. Now, I still have the same problem, though. How do I mount anything, how do I hold anything down up at this front end of the router so I can use the full format size? Well, that's what this is about here. Just a simple little plywood bridge, and I've got some slots cut, and then there's a groove underneath. That groove helps capture this head of my flange bolt. So, it'll go in like this, and that's going to prevent the flange bolt from turning and I can tighten up the hole down and clamp whatever I have in here. So now we're able to fully secure our workpiece and use the full format size, either using the bridge or by using the spoil board. And it's really made a difference, made it a lot easier to use this machine. Last thing, I wanted to look into a little bit of dust collection. Now on the show, we don't use dust collection very much because it's pretty dull watching a dust boot roam around on a board when you've got no idea what's going on underneath. But when we're not filming, I sure like to have dust collection going on. It's pretty easy to make a simple dust boot. There's a lot of different ways. This is one I've picked up on that's super simple, and that is using my CNC machine, I've cut a hole for the router or the spindle, and I've got a hole to insert a, uh, one of the plastic fittings of my vacuum hose. And then there's a, simply a carriage bolt running through, a nice wing nut that's easy on my hands, not one that's going to make the arthritis scream. And as I tighten it, it'll of course close this kerf here and tighten up on the router. The skirting that we see here is a conveyor sweep. It's rubber backed. I wish the, the bristles were a little more dense, but hey, it's available and it's easy to use. I purchased this from McMaster Car. No doubt there are other sources. And it's easy to take on and off, which is a good thing. The only thing I am going to work on is that it would really be nice to have it a little easier to slip on and off when there's a bit mounted into the router. So I'm kind of looking at more of a clamshell approach in the future, which can be taken on and off from the side. And I think that's something we're going to have to address on the show, is dust collection and making your own dust collection boots. Now, of course, the manufacturers offer have some offerings. I'm sure there are some entrepreneurs out there who have some dust boots as well. But you know what? They're easy to make, and you can also make them specifically for what you're doing, whether you're doing deep carving or shallow work or dealing with metal or whatever. Another important element of being comfortable and organized when using the CNC machine is that your controls need to be very visible. Now, this next wave machine comes with a little pendant, this black box here, which helps to control its motion, and you just use a flash drive. Uh, rather than having a computer. But whether you're using your laptop here or whether you're using a pendant, it sure is nice to have it placed so it's easy to see. For the pendant, I bought a little mount here, which I can change and adjust, screwed it to a board, and that means I can adjust it so it's easy for me to see without a lot of glare from the lights. 
And the same thing is going to be true if you have your laptop out. If you need to have it elevated, angled, then go ahead and find, find a solution and make it easy on yourself. So, a couple little things then to make a bit of a center here. It just makes it fun, it makes it organized, and I'm really enjoying that. So, a few thoughts for you. If you've got any thoughts, why don't you pass them on to me on the show site. I'd really enjoy hearing from you.